आज हमारे सामने हमारे मुख्य वक्ता श्री कुंडराट एस जी हैं मैं आपका ज़रा परिचय भी दूंगा और भी विस्तार में और आज क्यों हमने उनको यहाँ बुलाया है हमारा क्या संबंध है उनसे यूरोप में सनातन संस्कृति की खोज में हम लोग निकल पड़े अनेक जनजातियों से मिलना शुरू किया आपसे पहले भी परिचय था आप बेल्जियम की एक जनजाति है जिसको फ्लेमिंग्स कहते हैं और जब हम वहाँ पहुँचे तो वहाँ पर इन्होंने स्वयं अपने न केवल अपने जनजाति के बारे में बताया और ये भी बताया कि वो किस तरह से अपने समूह की संस्कृति को बचाने में लगे हुए हैं ये बहुत बड़ी बात थी यूरोप यूरोप के लिए हमारा भव्य स्वागत किया गया सबसे पहली चीज़ उन्होंने ये बताई कि मेरी हमारी देवी है ये चर्च की देवी नहीं है ये वहाँ पर ब्रसल्स में एक नदी बहती है उस नदी के अंदर जो मेरी की एक मूर्ति मिली इनकी पौराणिक मूर्ति ये सभी लोग मुझे और उस मूर्ति को चर्च ने अपने कैथेड्रल में लगाया इन्होंने वो सारे स्थान दिखाए और वो कैथेड्रल में भी लेके गए कि देखिए हमारी देवी को इन्होंने मदर मैरी बना दिया जब हम गांव-गांव में गए वहाँ के परिवारों के साथ रहे तो हमने देखा कि बड़े बड़े चौराहों पे पेड़ के नीचे इनकी देवी मैरी का छोटा सा मंदिर बना रहता है और ये पूरा समुदाय आज भी संघर्षमयी है उसको पूछता है मैरी को पूछता है फिर इन्होंने हवन करा हवन में भी हमने भाग लिया फिर ये हमें समुद्री तट पे लेके गए समुद्री तट पे बहुत सुंदर से मालों का गुच्छा बनाया उसको प्रभावित किया और उसके बाद इन्होंने मुझे और मेरी पत्नी को इनका जो पौराणिक ध्वज था उसके ऊपर हमें खड़ा होने के लिए कहा तो हमने कहा हम तो किसी भी ध्वज के चाहे चाहे वो आपका पौराणिक ध्वज है हम तो इसके ऊपर खड़े नहीं हो सकते हमारे यहाँ इसको अच्छा नहीं मानते तो इन्होंने कहा कि नहीं हम हमारे राजा को का चयन इसी प्रकार करते थे हमारे राजा को ध्वज पे खड़ा करके उसको कंधों पे लेके हम लोग जाते थे और वही हमारा राजा होता था तो आप कल्पना कर सकते हैं कि भारत से आया हुआ एक एक व्यक्ति को इन्होंने कितना बड़ा सम्मान दिया होगा वहाँ पर और हम तक इन्होंने स्वयं मुझे पूरे ब्रसल्स में घुमाया और वहाँ हमें जो पौराणिक चीज़ें हमें दिखाई दी घरों में घर के दरवाजों में हमारे यंत्र मिले यंत्र अंकित हैं बहुत लंबा इतिहास है इनका और ये जर्मनिक जनजाति कहलाते हैं जर्मन से जुड़ी हुई जनजाति है ये एक पक्ष था हमने पूरे यूरोप में काम खड़ा किया और आज हमें करीब 16 वर्षों के अंदर ये अनुभूति हुई कि पूरे यूरोप में सनातन संस्कृति का प्रभाव आज भी है विशेषकर जो भगवान परशुराम हैं उन्होंने अनेक उनके प्रभाव और उनके अनुयायी या उन उस समय के गए हुए लोग जो बाहर शायद भारत से भी गए होंगे एक प्रोफेसर आते हैं उनका व्याख्यान भी हम रखना चाहते थे यहाँ पर जो फ्रांस के आते हैं वो सब अपना वो सब मानते हैं कि हाँ और हमारे सभी देवी देवताओं को पूज रहे हैं वो लोग आज भी हैं और इसके ऊपर मैंने एक पुस्तक भी लिख दी है जिसका प्रकाशन भी हो गया है अगले महीने में उसका आ, बुक रिलीज भी होने वाला है उज्जैन से उज्जैन से हमने इसलिए रखा है क्योंकि भगवान परशुराम का जन्म उज्जैन में हुआ था इसलिए मैंने चाह कि आपको यहाँ बुलाया जाए और इनके मुख से स्वयं अपने जनजाति के बारे में बताएं ये स्वयं कह रहे हैं कि ये 
एक क्रिश्चियन परिवार में जन्म हुआ है लेकिन आप देखें कि आज स्वयं अपनी जनजाति के पौराणिक संस्कृति को बचाने के लिए किस तरह से अपने पूरे विश्व में और भारत में आपने अध्ययन किया बनारस हिंदू यूनिवर्सिटी से आप जुड़े रहे हैं और सनातन संस्कृति के ऊपर आज भारत में एक महान व्यक्ता के रूप में पूरे भारत में आप जाने जाते हैं मैं इतना ही कहूँगा और मैं इनका आभारी हूँ कि मेरा मे, मेरा निमंत्रण उन्होंने स्वीकार किया उसके लिए मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ धन्यवाद कीजिए कि मैं अभी अंग्रेजी में बोल दूँगा मेरी हिंदी इतनी अच्छी नहीं है कुछ आती है लेकिन सीरियस सब्जेक्ट नहीं एक्सप्रेस सकता हूँ ओके वेल I am looking around in this hall. It's uh, very different from anything I've ever seen. Um, this Nandi Nagari Lipi Varnamala seems to be an early form of the Devanagari script that pretty much everybody knows. But then this Karosti is the first time ever I see Karosti. And so the letters resemble those of the Hebrew alphabet. The common measure being Aramaic, which was the official language of the Persian Empire, which bordered India. Um, <laughs> but the structure of the alphabet is entirely like in Sanskrit. It's the same structure as Devanagari. Interesting. Okay. Um, so this is where your language came from. Uh, just just this afternoon, I received a decipherment. Uh, of the Harappan script, which was written here in India 4,000 years ago, four or five thousand years ago. And uh, it's, it's the 20th or so attempted decipherment that I get to see. Most of them are not convincing even at first sight. This one, I don't know, I'll have to look closely because it, it looks convincing. Let's see. Um, but so writing was here already 5,000 years ago. Um, many people in India say, well, the Rig Veda is the oldest book in the world. And then usually Westerners smirk and, and say, well, yeah, if, if, if those Hindu chauvinists want to believe that, you know, why wake them up? Uh, but in fact, uh, I think this is correct. You see, the Rig Veda is from earlier than 3000 BC, earlier than 5000 years ago, which is about the same age as the first writing in Sumeria and Egypt. But the difference is, <coughs> the first writing in Sumerian is quite pedestrian. It's lists for bookkeeping, you know, like uh, 10 kilo of, of grain and 100 kilo of rice and, and so on. And whereas in the Rig Veda, you get very high quality poetry from the beginning. So <clears throat> that is quite impressive. Uh, maybe the first Rig Vedic hymns even date before there was any writing at all. And so even a modern, rather anti-Hindu professor like uh, Michael Witzel says in so many words, that if today you hear a recitation of the Rig Veda, it is as if you are listening to a tape recorder made 5,000 years ago. Because it was all so perfectly preserved, all kinds of mnemotechnic uh, devices were <laughs> invented to keep the text as pure as possible, all kinds of mutual controls, different reciters could control and correct one another. <laughs> so this is very impressive. <clears throat> I don't know about India today. India has had a bit of a slump uh, the last 1,000 years because of uh, several, um, several invasions that destroyed a lot. Uh, the Islamic invasions were destruction pure and simple. The British were a bit more subtle. In fact, they revived a lot of Hindu traditions. 
They did archaeology, they brought old cities back to light, they deciphered ancient manuscripts and so on. They didn't destroy temples. But then at the same time, one thing is they impoverished India. Under the Mughal Empire, India did not become poorer. It became <laughs> less Hindu, you know, or more defensive in its Hinduness. But the economy kept on flourishing. And under the British, the economy was destroyed, so India was very impoverished. That's where Hindus get their inferiority complex from. Inferiority complex, which now is visibly becoming less, precisely because the economy is picking up again. And so it's a very good development. You know, whatever may be wrong with the present and the latest uh, governments, this they are certainly doing right. This Vikas, this development, is going full steam ahead. And so in, in this respect, you see, it gives Hindus a lot more self-respect. They do not have to fight for every crumb that falls from the table. Their life is just normalized. Similarly, in politics also, I think normalization is the, uh, the slogan of the hour. Like, for instance, what happened in 2019 about Kashmir. The situation before with Article 370 was totally abnormal. There is not one state in the world where a part of the country is off limits to the inhabitants of the rest of the country. You know, that you, you could only get in India under the uh, Nehruvian regime. So that was a normalization. Kashmir came back to normal. What any, um, any Pradesh, any uh, part of a country should be. <clears throat> so yes, um, India is doing just fine. Now, you know, if, if you expect me to say how great India is, well, that's not my job. You see, if you want, uh, Indians there certainly are enough who can do that, but if you per se want Westerners to praise India, then you invite Maria Wirt or David Frawley. You see, they will praise India to the sky, and usually they're correct in doing so. <laughs> but nevertheless, it is more in my nature to pick up the, uh, the painful points. So, on the theme of India as Vishwa Guru, let's uh, say some sobering uh, observations. <coughs> you see, if, if you are the Vishwa Guru, very soon people are going to say so. Like this Egyptian writer Nawal al Sadawi. Um, remarked that everybody has two countries, his own and India. See, nobody told her to say that, that's what she spontaneously remarked. And so, in the old days, before, before Hindu phobia came in, you see, many people, many Westerners, many Chinese people also have said so. You see, India, that's the center of the world. So you don't have to say this yourself. You see, Indians who say, oh, we are the Vishwa Guru. No. You see, if you are the Vishwa Guru, you don't, you don't say that. You know. Once I saw a TV program about the question whether Dutchmen have a sense of humor. And so they had a, a Swiss writer and a Belgian writer they came to testify why Dutchmen don't have humor. You know, they're boring. And then the, uh, the moderator, the leader of the program came and said, okay, you see, whatever those damn Swiss and Belgians say, I am convinced that this people has a sense of humor. However, we do not show that by saying, no, we have a sense of humor. We have a sense of humor. <laughs> no, you see, if you really have it, you really don't bother about these questions. So I think, you see, India is 
making an understandable mistake, but still a mistake, by calling itself the Vishwa Guru. Let others do that. Right. Now, <clears throat> nevertheless, we can ask ourselves, does India fulfill the criteria for being a Vishwa Guru? You see, is, is India geared to knowledge? You know, is knowledge production and knowledge transmission that central in India? Well, <clears throat> in terms of uh, school attendance, India is doing fairly good. That much is true. And you see, in, in contrast with Europe, where the quality of education is going down, down, down. You know, in India at least, they learn their mathematics and their spelling and everything still very correctly. Indeed, there are many complaints that children are given too much of a burden, having to learn too much, have to, to cram up so much material. Uh, yeah, maybe so, but you know, that's, that's erring on the right side, you see. You better do too much than too little. Um, so in that respect, there's nothing against India. However, what they learn, now that is a question. You see, they, they learn the same things as what they learn in the West. They learn their mathematics and so on. But, <clears throat> you see, in a place like this, I'm sure, I haven't witnessed it, but I'm sure that the traditional Hindu arts and sciences are given a serious amount of attention. <coughs> this in schools in general is much less the case. And indeed, uh, without attending classes in India, I can see the result, I can see the output. Namely, most youngsters know less and less about Hindu culture. Like, for instance, uh, <laughs> I remember in 2014, a Hindu organization, the RSS, was announcing that they were going to train 5,000 storytellers who would go to villages and other places and tell the stories from the Mahabharata because they had discovered that the knowledge of the Mahabharata was decreasing. Now, frankly, at that time, that was a silly idea because they had just won the elections. The BJP had come to power. There was a supposedly Hindu government. Isn't it the job of the government to make sure that in all the schools, they learn their national traditions? You see, why, like Boy Scouts, you see, send volunteers to everywhere to make up for a need that actually is the government's job? <clears throat> so now, with a, a great delay, I hear that the Modi government has finally um, made study of at least the Bhagavad Gita mandatory in schools. Now, that's a, a step in the right direction. Then, you see, there is a, a large field where people get their information, not through formal education, but through entertainment. And, you see, Bollywood movies traditionally were pretty anti-Hindu. You know, the, the hero was some Brahmin, very, very emphatically dressed as a Brahmin. And uh, the... The hero was a Christian or a Muslim, or at most a Dalit, even that was risky because that was still too Hindu. And, um, or, or you see, the hero has some doubts and, you know, he wonders, but then suddenly he sees a church and he goes do some parikrama around the church and then suddenly the light comes, he gets a good idea. And, and so, you see, very systematically, non-Hindu religions are put high above uh, Hinduism. Now, that is recently changing. It's not because of the government, 
but maybe it's the Hindu reputation of the government that is playing a role, because many people now have the impression, ah, uh, Hinduism is back in vogue, and so now we have to show our Hindu face. Like, for instance, uh, Rahul Gandhi claims now uh, that he is a Janeu wearing Brahmin. <laughs> And so, uh, in the generation of his uh, great-grandfather, on the mother's side, he was indeed a, a, a Kashmiri Brahmin, though not really an, a, a practicing one. But okay, very, you know. But then the other parts of his family are Christian, are Muslim, and so on. So it's very tenuous. But at least, you see, he, he finds reason to play that up, to, to highlight this Hindu component in his ancestry. <clears throat> or, for instance, also in the Congress party, this uh, Shashi Tharoor finds it suddenly necessary to write a book, Why I Am a Hindu. And so his type of Hinduism is very Nehruvian, very liberal, uh, but still, you see, he doesn't say why I'm a Christian or why I'm a Muslim. So suddenly it seems that Hinduism is a little bit back in vogue. And so you get movies like Kantara, which are very Hindu in their theme, or even, or even uh, highlighting some grievances of the Hindus like uh, the Kashmir files. I hope everybody has seen that one. Mm. So if, if you can get that far that uh, Time magazine and other uh, Hindu phobic papers denounce your movie as a step into <coughs> barbarism, then you're doing something right. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so not all is lost yet. You see, Hinduism has a chance of survival, uh, though I read many, pe many Hindu people who doubt that, who say, you see, this is the last generation of Hindus. It's disappearing, it's a lost cause. And for that, they mention two things. One is the now quite rapid westernization, let's say Americanization of culture. You know, all these uh, schoolgirls wearing blue jeans instead of saris. A lot of Western music is becoming popular and so on. Um, yeah. Then, of course, all the material culture, you get all these, you know, the cities look more like Western cities in the sense that they're full of skyscrapers and flyovers and so on. It's not the India that in my young days people used to come to India for. <clears throat> and so uh, India is less distinctive, a little bit less distinctive. But at the same time, um, I, I see many initiatives, private initiatives, to uh, give life back to Hindu traditions. And now I don't know how many people they reach, but they're quite substantial. And in every city I meet them, and often local varieties, unrecognizable elsewhere. But so, <laughs> and, and that's normal, you see. Hinduism always has a diversity, has a pluralism. You know, some, some Hindus say, oh, we need, we need uniformity. You see, all the Christians, all the Muslims, they come together once a week in the mosque or in the church. We also need that. I am not sure of that. You know, the, the, the best temples I've seen so far, and I'm not an expert, but I only describe what I've seen, um, are uh, small temples where only families can go, where you can't go with the whole village. Or, um, like for example, the Harsidhi temple in Ujjain, 
is one of the 51 Shakti Peets. And uh, so the goddess is worshipped there, but it's full of beautiful uh, illustrations, wall paintings and so on. And it really has this, this vibration, this very strong uh, atmosphere. Uh, so you see, those are the, the places to go to. Um, and so I don't think there is a need to change it. <coughs> no. Uh, so you see, with the increasing uh, ease by Hindus in their own traditions, in their own identity, I think that the, um, the perpetuation of Hindu traditions will continue. A second factor, apart from cultural Americanization, that makes Hindus fear for the future is the demographic evolution. Vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis both Christians and Muslims. You see, Christians usually practice the government-mandated uh, birth control, uh, though they're not very sure about that anymore. Some Kerala bishop has ordered uh, a letter to be read in all churches uh, that Christian families should have at least four children because they're totally running out of steam compared to the uh, Muslims in Kerala. Uh, the latest figures I've seen there are that 26% of the population is Muslim, but 42% of the new births are in Muslim families. So there's a very fast increase. Um, so it's not only the Hindus who notice this, the Christians, the same thing. And so the, 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 the population figure among Muslims per family is also coming down like everywhere, but always slower than among Hindus. So they're always having more children, so their percentage of the population is always growing. Among Christians, you have a different situation. Their birth figure is about the same. <coughs> However, their population is increasing and quite fast increasing and far more than you realize. This is because there are ever more crypto Christians. So they, I mean, they're now instructed by their converters, okay, you pretend for the census that you are Hindu, you keep your Hindu name, you may have a Christian name that you use among one another, but officially you keep your Hindu name so that they don't notice just how fast Christianity is growing. So you have these two situations, and uh, you do notice that in uh, region after region, Hindus are becoming a minority, or are starting to feel like in the situation of a minority, simply because they're not secure anymore. So that is, that is very much true, and um, not to... Uh, to shirk the difficult issues, I'm going to try to formulate a solution to that. So one thing that Hindus believe in nowadays is Garvapasi, which is what a hundred years ago the Arya Samaj called Shuddhi, purification. But so Garvapasi, homecoming, where ex-Hindus who have become Christian or Muslim are returning to Hinduism. Now, that's, that's good, that's the, I support that. But I have the impression that the real solution will come from somewhere else. And it's not the doing of Hindus. Namely, from internal processes that are affecting and that are eating into the Muslim and Christian communities. I myself am an ex-Catholic, and I think there are some saffron-clad people here who also have some kind of Christian background. Um, I can assure you that we are only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, in Europe, you see, my country, for example, the northern half of Belgium, where they speak Dutch, was a real frontline state of the Catholic Church. 
you know, it, it had to stand strong against Protestant Holland, Anglican England, secular Masonic France, Lutheran Germany. So it was an outpost of the church, just like Ireland. And um, so people were very Catholic. Everybody went to church on Sunday. Everybody, of course, was baptized, had a, the name of one of the gospel writers and so on. Um, I myself, of course, there are three saints named Konrad, but I was specifically named after Konrad Adenauer, who was the first chancellor of Germany after the National Socialist nightmare. And so my father was also an activist for, you see, Catholic politics. And those people were very proud that it fell to one of them uh, to revive Germany after this, uh, this, this, this crisis. Um, and so the first son in our family was named after him. So, you see, the theme was, you know, militant Catholicism. Now, that was true in the 1950s. That already started to erode in the 1960s. Then from 1970 onwards, you get a collapse. And so now, um, churches are empty. Many churches are being either demolished or if they have some historical value, they are turned into something else. They are turned into restaurants or, for instance, the church where I was in the church choir that has become the swimming pool of the next door school. And um, some become mosques. I haven't heard yet, certainly not in Belgium, of a uh, church that became a temple, but I'm sure that that is in the range of possibilities. So, this has not happened in India yet, partly because people here are very religious. You see, many people in Europe left Christianity along with the whole idea of religion itself, which is not necessary. Some people remain religious but are looking elsewhere than in Christianity. Uh, whereas in India, this religious urge is very strong. And so, you see, <laughs> many people take that religiosity into whichever religion they convert to. You know, if they convert to Christianity, they still remain religious. If they convert out of Christianity, they still remain religious, most of them at least. Um, now, this, this uh, phenomenon of becoming disloyal to your community, namely by apostasy, by leaving your religion, that's a lot harder to do in India, I admit. Why? Because here you have different religious communities, you know, standing strong against one another. And so if you leave that community, it is as if you are leaving a besieged fortification. It is really betrayal, it is running over to the enemy. Uh, so that's much less easy here than it has been in the West. Nevertheless, I think here it is also happening. And in particular, you see in Christianity we're already used to that. In Europe it ha happened massively. Now it is happening in the United States, which for long was the stronghold of Christianity. Um, and so in India, it is inevitably going to happen or starting to happen. But the really remarkable thing is that the same can be said about Islam. <clears throat> there is a lot of interest in, in the media in uh, this um, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, who seems to be very progressive. And so he does small cosmetic changes, like for instance, he has allowed women in Saudi Arabia to drive a car, which was prohibited to them until recently. Now, I cannot look into his head. I don't know what he's secretly thinking, but there are two possibilities. Either he thinks that this is 
what is called repressive tolerance, that is to say, allowing things in order better to keep control. So making a few little concessions in order to ultimately keep and strengthen the control by Islam. Or he may think, okay, this is the beginning of letting everything go and just dismantling the control by Islam. I'm not sure which of the two, but I suspect it is essentially the same as what the bishops in our country thought and did in the 50s and 60s. They had full control, and yet they made a few concessions to the, the modern age, the spirit of modernity, and they thought that this way they could keep control. Like, for example, my uncle was a parish priest, and he was a, a perfect incarnation of the enormous power of the Catholic Church at the time. You see, he was the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the chaplain of uh, all kinds of organizations, the, the Women's Guild, the Youth Movement, the Sports Associations, the Brass Band, and so on. He, was, he incarnated the all-seeing eye of the church in all, in all parts of society. <clears throat> and so this was largely an answer to a, uh, a threat of modernity that had earlier happened. <clears throat> Namely, uh, you had, for example, the socialists, who were usually ex-Christians in the 19th century already, who started trade unions. And so then the Catholic Church answered to that. Okay, we are going also to set up a trade union. Or, for instance, a new phenomenon around the turn of the 20th century was the Boy Scout movement, which was boys from urban, well-to-do families who on Sunday afternoon would go to the forest and discover nature and so on. The church frowned on this. They said, this is nature worship. This is secret paganism. They didn't want to encourage it. But then they couldn't stop it. So what did they do? They co-opted it. They started their own scouting movement. Like in my country, it was called um, association, Flemish Association for uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. Uh, no, no, no. Flemish Catholic Association for Boy Scouts and Girl Guys. And so everything was the same, except that we went to church every Sunday. Ah. Um, now that hasn't helped, you see. For a while they thought, oh, now we have this whole modernization, these new social phenomena, we have it under control. But no, ultimately it escaped their control. You see the same thing now in the Muslim world where they are faced with this new problem of the new technology in, in communication with the internet. And so, yes, they are present on the internet. You have all kinds of websites where you can go for Islamic advice. You see, what does the Sharia say if you have this or this or this problem? And so they, they again think that they are with the, the, the age, with the modern, uh, modern tendencies. Yet, you see, the medium is the message. You know, this, this whole uh, world of internet creates a lot of possibilities that the Islamic establishment can't control. You know, every youngster can go to websites where you find the whole, you know, problem side of Islam, where you have critical discussion of Muhammad or the genesis of Islam, of everything that Islam does wrong today in Iran, in Arabia, in Pakistan, and so on, uh, where you have the history of Islam in India, uh, with all the you know jihad that has happened, and uh, so you have more and more apostasy from Islam. Like there is an American institution, the Pew Research Institute, that conducts these very interesting polls. And so, for already a few decades, every uh, 10 years, they ask around in Arab countries about the religiosity. And so they notice that this is going down systematically. 
and that especially among young people, more and more dare to say openly, no, I don't believe in Islam anymore. So in India, necessarily, this goes only slowly because people are afraid to de-solidarize themselves from their own community. But nevertheless, it's also happening. So you see, for those who say, ah, before the end of the century, India is going to be an Islamic country, well, I don't think so. You see, um, maybe to please the Constitution and the Nehruvians, I might take a term from the Constitution, namely the scientific temper. You see, the scientific temper is a notion that was put in there by Nehru because he opposed Hinduism. He thought, you see, this is a good weapon against all the superstitions of Hinduism. Now, in reality, in Hinduism, there is some dead wood, some silly traditionalism that indeed will fall to the, the scientific temper. But on the whole, you see, Hinduism is perfectly capable of modernizing itself, of going with the scientific temper. By contrast, in the case of Christianity and Islam, the basic doctrine is flawed. You see, you have a number of external elements that are very good, like, for instance, arts. You see, here in Hindu temples, you have beautiful architecture, sculpture, music, dancing, and so on. Well, I can assure you, in a Catholic cathedral, you have the same. You know, again, it's very beautiful. A lot of beautiful music was produced out of religious enthusiasm and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong, however, and what is unsustainable for anyone who looks at it with a scientific temper is the basic doctrine that you see Jesus came on earth as the son of God, that he redeemed us from sin and that he did so by rising from the dead. Well, you know, if you read the Bible critically, that can't be sustained. There must have been a historical figure, Jesus, who thought high of himself, who thought that he were, were miracles. But you see, not more than that. I mean, you have many cult leaders, even today, when everybody has a scientific education, who nevertheless get a following, even though they say very funny things. But so that doesn't prove that they're really the son of God or anything of the kind. Um, so, you see, it is the very basis of Christianity or of Islam that is not going to survive the age of the scientific temper, whereas in Hinduism it may lose a few of its feathers, but essentially it's going to remain. That's why it's Sanatana. Okay, thank you.